this yeah. program you're talking mm -hmm. about, MBSR, has oh. been running actually for more than 30 years. Yes. Yeah. And so there's a lot of different, more than you mentioned, mm -hmm. a lot of different results that came from this. Yes, a lot of different um, yeah. But there's a couple of things. One is you can't measure how well somebody is doing med mindfulness meditation. So you can say you put people through a course and then you can measure certain variables, mm -hmm. but you don't know how well they were meditating or how hard or how much effort they were putting into it or how suited they are to it. Mm -hmm. It's only measured by how many times they got back to the hospital. Right. And also, a lot of the measure measurements were on physical aspects. So they're measuring heart rates, they're measuring gene expression, yes. uh, blood pressure and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And those things were shown to actually have a very... Uh, the meditation had a significant effect yes. within that eight weeks, within oh. a short term right. um, span. Yeah. 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 Have you ever met somebody who meditation doesn't work for? Uh, sure, some people, I, I'm not sure you would say it doesn't work mm -hmm. it's for them, uh, but they didn't like it. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for a lot of people it's not, it's not a um, thing that is for everybody. Yes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you think that's true of Buddhism? That is not for everyone. Sure. Mm -hmm. And when the Buddha became enlightened, he said, uh, "This generation, with all its desires and cravings, they will not understand what I have to say." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he acknowledged from the start that not many people were really going to be able to okay. um, pick it up, use the the tools that he was giving, uh -huh. and become enlightened. Okay. What about you, uh, Holly? Have all of your patients been helped by meditation, or no, no, no? Uh, I think, it, in fact, it's contraindicated with some conditions. I was talking earlier about obsessive mm -hmm. compulsive disorder. It's probably mm -hmm. not a good um, patient to teach mindfulness meditation because mm -hmm. it's hard and count, um, counterproductive. Yeah. Why? Why would a, a obsessive compulsive person not? be able to use m mindfulness and meditation? Um, in the mindfulness, at one point it might be good mm -hmm. because they can calm themselves, but obsessive mm -hmm. compulsive wants to control and um, and actually there's some physiological involvement that's it's, it's hereditary mm -hmm. obsessive compulsive disorder often. Um, but some people get a repetitive thought on their mind yeah. and just spiral down with it and mm -hmm. get quite desperate. Uh, do not have the cognitive control to, or the emotional control to keep the thought moving on. Might come up with even bleaker thoughts. You know, you could spiral if you let yourself do that. So um, they wouldn't have. Um, unless they practiced a lot with the concentration first, they wouldn't have maybe the tools to get themselves out of a downward spiral. I see, yeah, yeah. So and also there's physical involvement and the mindfulness meditation doesn't do anything to uh, address the physiological, the psychomotor agitation that is involved sometimes in obsessive compulsive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one question is though that <clears throat> whether it's the meditation that's really having the effect or whether it's the environment, getting people away on a retreat, giving them an eight week course, because uh, you have this syndrome or that... having if, just a nice person saying yes you're doing the right, right. thing. So mm -hmm. if you give placebos to people and you have a certain effect of a placebo, mm -hmm. but if a doctor in a coat with a clipboard gives you a placebo, mm -hmm. the effect is magnified. Right because of the, the person who's given it to you. Yeah. And also, if you've invested time and effort into something, you would self-report that it's more beneficial. Yes. Right. Yeah. So if you've done an eight-week program, you're more likely to report it as being beneficial. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the question is whether it's exactly the meditation, or might say yoga, uh -huh. or other relaxation therapies, right. or listening to relaxing music, or a drama workshop, Yes. There's a lot of these alternative therapies around at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. We have to really isolate what is the effect of the mindfulness meditation yes. and what is the effect of just the program in general. Yeah. Right. So, so and also, um, 
as far as severe mental illness, these light things are counterproductive. Art therapy with schizophrenics, it could be fun, but it may not actually help. Mm, yeah. And, um, right. There was a recent survey, I don't know if you saw it, a long, very long-term survey, I think 40 years, and they found people with a, with a certain amount of stress in their lives actually lived longer and healthier. Uh, so some of these things, they're measuring a very short-term effect. Mm -hmm. But this particular survey was saying that if, if you uh, really apply yourself to things, you have a certain amount of stress and energy, uh, actually you're living a healthier lifestyle in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, you might live a long time. Yeah, but stressful <laughs> month. <you laughs> because <laughs> I know you're very busy organizing this uh, little Bangkok Sangha, so in fact you may have a lot more stress in your life than uh, most lay people, I'm not sure. And it's a misnomer that meditation is about stress or having less stress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more about understanding yourself yeah. and okay. um, not so much about less stress. Yeah. I think the stress thing comes in that people think that you live out in the forest and you've got little birdies tweeting and it's it's so lovely mm -hmm. uh, but that's not meditation that's not progress on the spiritual path that's just chilling out in the forest so the meditation really isn't so much concerned with stress and the handling of stress as it is about a very real fundamental change in your whole being yes but chilling out in a forest actually might be very helpful right? might, might do in the yeah. first step towards sure. uh, being able it to look it, um, at might demonstrate to someone what it actually feels like to be thoroughly calm. Yes. And so yeah. if you did a guided meditation, and some people go to the forest, some people go to the beach, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I did with one client, I, I, I let her do it. She, mm -hmm. I said, to, tell me you go to the forest, go to the beach. Oh yes, I'm going to go to the forest and there'll be a little cottage. It was sort of a little fairy tale, and I said, and what are you going to find there? Mm -hmm. And she said, I'm going to find a little old lady who's going to make me a cup of tea. Oh, and so that was, you know, as she made herself a caring experience, yes. and then she could go there again when she needed that kind of refuge, mm -hmm. but it didn't yeah. actually address her big issue, which Right, long term, you've got to make a fundamental shift in the being. That's what the meditation is really about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So very often it's not a case of calming down or de-stressing. It's a mm -hmm. case of going into what makes you stressed, what kind of, which, what ways are you living your life, how can you change your whole approach to your the experience of thinking, to the experience of desiring. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is quite an exciting and quite an vibrant yeah. uh, path. It's uh -huh. not a case of getting calm and chilling out. Right. That's yeah. true. It is absolutely life changing. Mm -hmm. And recognizing from the Buddhist perspective those parts of the self that are conditioned and mm -hmm. unpacking your conditioning. Right. And yes, yeah. getting out untangling the tangle. Yeah. Untangling those candas. They're knit too tight. So you see the calming aspect of meditation is just the beginning really, then you have to go further and look into yourself and get to know yourself. Yeah, to a large degree, mm -hmm. and um, when you start doing the meditation, that's kind of the plan, just to calm things down, but yeah. you only calm things down so you can see more clearly what's happening. Right. Uh, the Buddha himself was never really teaching uh, meditation in this way. This is something that's come up really in the West. Mm -hmm. Even in Thai temples, the abbot or the teacher, he won't usually try to calm you down, he'll try and rouse you up. So teachers here, they tend to talk all the way through the meditation, they're continuous saying, put forth effort, sit up straight, work mm -hmm. hard at it, be mindful the whole time. Yes. And it's very much the Westerners who've picked up meditation that have decided it's something about calming down and being still. I see, yeah. If you compare to the Buddha's own statement, he said, the amount of energy you should, and effort you should be putting in mm -hmm. is the same as if your hair was on fire how much effort would you put forth to put out the flames? Right? I see. Now if you check on YouTube, you can see some, have a look on YouTube, Hair on Fire. Mm -hmm. And there's a few clips on there. And you, you can see people are really urgent putting out the fire. Yes. Brilliant. And he said, this is how hard you should be doing the meditation. Uh -huh. So when you go back to the original suttas, it wasn't a 
calming down and they're being peaceful and they're being de-stressed. Mm -hmm. This is a really vibrant, active, mm -hmm. hard work that the monks are being put through in the jungles. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Right, right, right. Should and the hard work and um, the difficulty of it, as you said, makes it worth that much more. Mm -hmm. But also makes the um, makes the change happen. Mm -hmm. It's just that psychologically, not everyone can do it, not everyone wants to do it, mm -hmm. and some people are not really capable. Well, this is what happened with the, in the West. I remember Ajahn Sumedho talking about this, uh, and he said that if he would try to teach meditation this way, the Westerners would, get, would pick it up, and they would try as hard, but in the wrong way, mm -hmm. and they would start creating these really rough, unstable states of mind. So he actually said as a deliberate plan that he, he turned it around and focused more on the calming down yeah. than the rousing up. Yes. Could, could meditation destabilize a person? Of course. Hopefully. Uh -huh. yes. That's the plan. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. It doesn't want to make you more of what you, what you are already. You, yeah. want to, you want to get past what you are. Yeah. So it should shake you up, should yeah. break things down. But could it have negative impact, supposing this person is shaken up and uh, sort of loses whatever pattern that they had before, uh, could it be dangerous? It's hard to say because some people have kind of had some episodes from meditation but then mm -hmm. are they predisposed to that anyway? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking mindfulness meditation will only uncover what's already there. It's not going to create anything new. Mm -hmm. But if it is trauma and you've been defending against it Yes, it could, you, you know, it would mm -hmm. revive trauma, yeah. and um, there can be, it, it, I used to deal with a lot of older people, now being an older person, I hope not to have to do that so much, but I used to tell myself, there are those who want you to open them up, and there are those who want you to cover them up. Yeah. So, in asking, I would see people with signs of trauma, and then I would maybe try to back away and tiptoe and see how see. severe it might be before I Okay, it. yeah. Well, I'm sorry, but our time is up right now, so I want to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Holly, for coming and answering these questions and Most doing welcome. such a good job. And My also, Bob Panda, thank you very much for taking the time to come and thank you very much for the insight that you have shown in your answers and, and thank you for watching and uh, we'll be back next week. I look forward to seeing you then.